Everybody. My name is Connor and welcome to another episode or webinar with the St. Louis Zoo. Now, I'm an educator with the St. Louis Zoo and you may notice I am wearing a mask around my neck today. Now I'm in my personal living space. I'm not at the St. Louis Zoo, um, but just as a reminder, we are open uh, to the public. And if you would like to visit us, please feel free to go to our website, make that free time reservation, and of course, bring your mask. Now I'm gonna be wearing it around my neck because I'm alone in, in my living space today. Now today we are talking about cold water adaptations. So get ready for a little bit of a relief from the summer heat. We're gonna talk a lot about some cold weather and some cold water and all kinds of exciting things with that. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our full, first poll. I wanna ask um, all of you if you've ever taken a polar bear plunge. Now if you don't know what a polar bear plunge is, it is essentially jumping in icy cold water, just like a polar bear would. Now, some people are really brave. And in my area in St. Louis, in the winter, they might jump in a pond. Or they might even jump into a lake or something that's been frozen over. Now, this is usually common where it's cold most of the year round. Um, but some people are very brave. So let's give us a few more seconds. It looks like none of us want to take a polar bear plunge oh no well i'll tell you what on a 98 degree day that icy cold water might start sounding a little bit better <laughs> so hopefully as we get through summer these icy cold adaptations are going to be more and more alluring for us now i want to go ahead and start us off with the globe the globe is a nice thing to use to give us a reference as to where we're talking about today so this is my animal globe it doesn't say countries but it does show animals that are found in different areas um, in different continents. So today we're talking about cold water areas, mainly the Arctic Circle and Antarctica. So the poles of our planet. Now we know the equator is the hottest part. So it makes sense that the furthest, the further you get from the equators, the colder it gets. Now up here and down here are the coldest spots on, on our entire planet. But as you can see, there's still plenty of life that is found, things like polar bears, lots of different seabirds, marine mammals like killer whales, walruses, seals, all kinds of animals. And then on the bottom, the south, <laughs> in Antarctica, we see there are still some deep water animals, animals like penguins and more seabirds, seals, uh, whales, and all kinds of marine mammals um, and birds as well. Now that is not a complete list of all the animals that can be found there. I could talk on and on about all the animals we can find, but today we're gonna to talk about what makes those animals special. How do they survive in an area like that? None of us wanted to jump into icy water. And that's probably because we, a lot of us have common sense. We don't like to get super cold to where our body is bright red and we're shivering and we're risking hypothermia. Not always everybody's idea of a fun time. So when we see animals that spend their entire lives in an area where it is freezing cold year round, it's kind of cool to learn how they do it because I would not survive even a couple hours in Antarctica, especially wearing my t-shirt that I'm wearing today. But a, a penguin, it does very well and they live their entire lives in Antarctica. So let's learn a little bit about some of the cool adaptations that make these animals so good at surviving in some of the most extreme areas on the planet. So cold water adaptations. Here's a beautiful picture of the Arctic Circle, the North Pole from space. So if you look just the bottom right on that picture there, you can see the Great Lakes in the United States and everything above there looks like a big sheet of ice. It looks like everything just got covered in snow. So we see that this area is very, very cold. Now in the North Pole, polar bears are very common. They're kind of my first species I think about in the North Pole. Now, the, one of the th things that makes polar bears so well adapted to this area is their fur. Now, I say fur slash hair. A lot of people think that they are two separate things um, or that uh, they come from different animals and things like that. Now, fur is chemically indistinguishable from hair. It's made up of all of the same molecules. If you look at it under a microscope, each little molecule looks the exact same. But there are some structural differences in the hairs of fur, <laughs> if that makes sense. So hair, like mine, is usually thinner. Um, each little follicle is probably very small and can only let a few little hairs out of each tiny hole. But fur is very dense and the thickness of the hairs can be much larger, which helps 
these animals insulate their heat inside their bodies a little bit better. So with an animal like a polar bear, we see um, fur working not only as a nice big coat to keep them warm, but also as insulation with air pockets. So this is pretty cool. The fur works kind of like this cup. How does the fur work like a cup, Connor? That's a weird comparison. I'll show you. Now inside this cup, you'll see that there are two walls. You've probably seen little tumblers or um, insulated cups that have this before. Now inside that little layer is air. And that air is preventing the temperature of the inside of your cup from being exposed to the temperature outside of the cup. So this little layer, this insulative uh, bubble, the air pocket, keeps the temperature outside from affecting the temperature inside. It works just like the windows in our house. It keeps all of the temperatures uh, kind of consistent as best as they can. So what the polar bear's hair is doing, and coincidentally, polar bear fur is also clear like this, so that's kind of a fun comparison, but it is trapping air pockets in between all of the hairs so that the polar bear's skin doesn't touch the icy cold water it's swimming in. So a lot of the times when polar bears or other cold water animals that have thick fur, think of like sea otters or maybe a, a long-haired seal or, or a sea lion, um, what they're doing is they're trapping air in their fur so that they're not even touching the cold water they're swimming in. It's a very neat little insulation trick that they have. It helps keep the water out completely, just like your skin keeps the, the water from touching the, your insides, but that skin doesn't keep temperature from affecting um, the insides a whole lot. So that fur works as a great barrier to keep the cold out and the heat in. The next one we're gonna talk about is blubber. Now, I don't like to use the word blubber or fat when I'm talking about animals, because some animals are naturally blubbery or rounder, and that makes them well suited to the environment they live in. So a lot of the times when we say this animal is fat, it comes off a little insulting. It might come off as a little odd. Well, this animal is fat, but they're supposed to be fat. They have a lot of blubber, or they have fat, I should say. <laughs> now, blubber and fat are two slightly different things. Blubber is a type of fat um, that has extreme, uh, blah. It has more blood vessels in it than regular fat does. Because of this, some scientists say blubber is its own tissue altogether. Some scientists say that blubber is more of a vascularized version of fat. Whatever you want to call it, blubber is another great insulator. So just like the fur, it keeps the cold temperatures from getting inside of the animal's body. So that blubber, believe it or not, is very important to keep these animals alive. Now, this is a picture of one of the harbor seals at our zoo, and she does have some blubber because she is adapted to um, that Arctic weather, that cold water. So what that blubber does for our harbor seals is it gives them a nice little layer to keep the cold out, keep the warm in. It also helps them stay afloat. But blubber, believe it or not, is very important for seals buoyancy to help them float and swim. So each of these seals needs a certain amount of blubber on their body to be able to swim properly. And it also works as a nice food store. So this is a really important part of cold water adaptations, just like here in the Midwest, we're all from kind of the St. Louis area from when I saw, just like here, those cold water the areas, those extreme ends of our planet experience seasons. And as a result, just like here, sometimes food is more available than other times of the year, depending on the season. So these animals, they usually bulk up. They eat a lot when there's a lot of food available and they get as much fat and as much blubber on them as they possibly can. Now that blubber doesn't only keep them warm, but it also keeps them fed for a certain amount of time. So what they're doing is they're storing nutrients for later so that their body can use it when there's no food around for them to eat. So blubber is not just an insulator, but it's also kind of a nice little uh, food storage strategy that a lot of animals need uh, because there's just simply not a lot of food around depending on the time of year. Okay, now our next adaptation I want to talk about here is unique to birds. <laughs> no other cold water animal will grow this adaptation. It's feathers. And feathers are a very special way of staying insulated. They work a lot like the fur that we were talking about with the polar bear, but these feathers, especially on penguins, 
are very, very uh, complex and specialized for where they live. These penguins can live out of, mm, or excuse me, in, in freezing temperatures for most of their lives. So what they're doing is they're taking a bunch of these feathers. Now I am lucky enough to have a few penguin feathers that were um, found at the zoo. Now, just like all birds, feathers uh, fall out very routinely, just like our hair, it comes out in little pieces. So these were not taken from any penguins, they were just picked up, um, but I'm lucky enough to have a few feathers from our rock hopper penguins. Now, if you look closely, you notice they're very tiny and they look very fuzzy. These are clearly not um, feathers that are designed for flying, like you'd see on maybe a goose, those very long, thick feathers. These are kind of thin and wispy, kind of cloudy. Oh, I should, <laughs> I should stop sharing my screen here so you can see these feathers up close. Here we go. Now you'll notice they're very fluffy, they're very light, but on a penguin, when they're all connected to the bird, they're also very dense. Now, when we look at our hair, we can look at our scalp and we can see how close each of those little roots are for our hairs. And feathers are the same way. They grow out of the skin the same way. These penguin feathers are incredibly dense and they overlap kind of like scales or even our hair um, to keep a nice layer of air and oil to keep the water from touching their skin. So similar to the, the air pocket the polar bear makes um, and the blubber that keeps the heat out or the heat in, excuse me, um, penguins will use the air pockets that they create by preening, which is, here's a replica of penguin skull. I can show you what preening kind of looks like. I'm not very good at controlling it, but this is just a plastic skull. And what they do is they preen. So they pick at the feathers on their body. And what they're doing is they're making small air pockets between those feathers to make sure that the cold water is still staying out and keeping their body on the inside warmed up. So similar effect, but totally different way of doing it. They grow feathers rather than fur. <laughs> Another thing to remember with birds is that they have a special gland for preening that produces an oil, and that's called a uropigial gland. Now, you don't have to remember that word. I will not test you on it. But the important thing about it is that most birds have it, and it is essential for penguin survival. If penguins did not take from that gland a little bit of oil and then spread it all over their feathers, they wouldn't keep as much water out. That oil repels water. You've ever heard of oil and water don't mix. That's exactly right. And birds having a little bit of oil on their feathers um, allows them to repel that water and keep that cold water from affecting the inside of their body too much. So when they take these polar bear plunges, all of these cold water adapted animals are kind of avoiding the water in some way because any animal that needs to have a body temperature of above 90 degrees would have a hard time staying alive in water temperatures below zero. So this is why they are able to survive in these areas. Now, the last thing that I wanna talk about today, this is my very uh, special uh, uh, animal of note. This is not an animal we have at the zoo. The other three were the harbor seal, the polar bear, and the emperor, or excuse me, the king penguin are all at the St. Louis Zoo, and they are all very cool cold water animals that we're fortunate enough to have in St. Louis. Now, this is one that we could not have in St. Louis at all. It's a very hard one to take care of outside of the wild, and it's incredible. Uh, now, this is called the ice fish, and there are about 16 species of ice fish. They're almost all found in Antarctica or somewhere around it. <clears throat> now, these ice fish live where the water is below freezing. So it's salt water, and salt water usually freezes right at the sur surface at a certain temperature, way below the temperature that fresh water freezes at. So these fish are living where the water is pretty much frozen everywhere at the top, except for a little bit at the bottom where there's still some salt water that even though it's freezing cold, hasn't frozen yet because the water's moving and things like that. Now, a cool thing to note about cold water is it holds more oxygen than warm water. So because of this, these ice fish are able to survive where any other fish would freeze to death. So what they do is they, as you can see in the picture on the right, they look kind of clear and their blood is actually very clear as well. That's because it lacks hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the thing um, in our red blood cells that carries iron and oxygen throughout our body and um, through our bloodstream. So when we breathe in, 
our hemoglobin picks up oxygen molecules, it brings it to all of our muscles that need to function, and then it comes back, circles back around to pick up more oxygen. Now these ice fish don't have red blood cells. They are the only vertebrates. Now we're talking upwards of 50,000 species of animals that have a backbone. They're the only ones that don't make hemoglobin. They just lost their genetic trait to do so. Now, as a result, they've adapted to just take the oxygen straight from the water and rather than circulate it through their body, they're just absorbing it through their body all the time. Very unique, very fascinating animals. Now, there's only about 16 species, I said, of those. So out of the 50,000 or so vertebrates, this is a very unique, very rare trait to have. Um, it's one that you only find in those cold water areas. Now, because this animal is so specialized, you might imagine that if temperatures change, they might have a hard time adapting. And that's absolutely true. We found a lot of the fish species that are adapted for cold water environments, animals in the North Pole, like Atlantic cod, Arctic cod, and in the South Pole, more uh, ice fish and things like that. Now, when these animals face changing water temperatures, they're not adapted to live in warmer climates. So because this animal has no hemoglobin, it doesn't have the ability to pick up oxygen and carry it through its body. If the water were to warm up and there was less oxygen in the water, they couldn't absorb it all through their skin like they are now. So this little bit of a change, just a couple degrees difference, can bring devastation to these areas because this ice fish is a nice little bridge species. I like to call them bridge species. I'm sure there's a better name for it. Maybe a primary consumer is a better way for it. But what they do is they eat the um, autotrophic animals, the planktons and the very small invertebrates and crustaceans. And then they are then food for animals like seals, penguins, polar bears, other marine predators that we're talking about today, especially like seabirds. So if these ice fish were to escape, there would be no bridge to bring the nutrients from plankton to the larger animals. So this little key in that system holds the balance right here, these little fish right here. If there was no way to convert the energy from plankton into food for animals as large as leopard seals, all of those animals would surely quickly disappear. So we love these animals. I think they're very special, they're very unique. Um, and they're absolutely one that we want to help out as much as we can. Now, if you're interested in helping out with cold water areas, there's a lot of great information on our website. Um, you can go to our conservation tab and learn about any way you can help with Arctic or Antarctic habitats. Um, we have a lot of species of concern that we're doing very good work with as well. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my PowerPoint. I'll catch up on my chat here. Okay. Most, most birds have that uh, oil gland that they produce, but uh, birds that are adapted for especially aquatic lifestyles, they need that oil uh, even more so. Okay, now if there are any questions, now is a great time to submit them. Um, I'll go ahead and check my Q&A. Um, I see we did have a question that asked about our Zoom classes. Um, we do have many of these on our website. If you'd like to check it out, there's a lot of great uh, uh, webinars that have been made by our entire team. I'll go ahead and ask our next poll, our last poll, which is, which cold water area is your favorite? So remember, we're talking about the Arctic, where the polar bears and the orcas and the, the seals and uh, walruses are found, or the Antarctic, where we find penguins, seabirds, some of the largest seals in the world, and, well, also orcas. Orcas are found at both. That's a fun fact. <laughs> Okay, so we said most people are fans of the Arctic. That's a little closer to home for us, so I can see that. But quite a few of us said Antarctic. Very cool. Um, now, I see another Q&A question that says, do you prefer cold habitats? I do not. I do not like the cold. Um, if it were up to me, I would hibernate right through winter every year. That's just how I am. Uh, but that being said, that does not mean I do not have an appreciation for the animals that can specialize and live there. I think it's incredible that animals... Oh, like a polar bear can live in an area that I would not survive more than a couple hours. They live their entire lives in an area that would give me hypothermia very quickly. I'm going to go ahead and show off this skull. This is our, my polar bear replica skull that I have lying around just because of how things are in my life. <laughs> I think it's really cool to show some of the uh, size comparisons of these animals we're talking about because it's cool to see 
a polar bear on a, on a picture or something like that. But then you remember that a polar bear can grow to be 10 feet tall, as, even taller than that, which is as tall as my ceiling. They make me look very small. So I do have a lot of respect for these cold water animals, even though I don't want to live where they live. <laughs> Okay, and then we have another question that says, what is your favorite warm keeper thing? Hmm, so if we're talking about like our cold water adaptations to keep us warm, I think my favorite one is blubber. I think it's kind of neat that it has a lot of different purposes. It can work as a, a meal for later. It can work to keep you afloat like water wings. It can keep you nice and warm and it also protects a lot of animals. Animals like walruses, if they have a huge amount of blubber, even a polar bear can't grab them and make a meal out of them because they're just too dense and big to get a handle on. So it's a weird and cool adaptation. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end us there. Thank you all for joining us. Again, remember the zoo is open. If you'd like to visit us, please feel free to make that time reservation for free online. And of course, bring your mask. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Take care.